We took off, we flew down there, but basically the time we got at altitude run in, we were getting shot at all the way down the, down the track. Didn't get hit, but we were getting shot at. Seen flashes all of them. Base was under attack. Dropped the load. Two of the 12 bundles burned in, the chutes disintegrated um, because the load was probably not too heavy or whatever. The chutes, 10 of them hit the ground, smacked on the middle of the LC, and we flew home. You know, the crew ended up getting some awards for that, but I didn't need to know that that, that changed those guys' life on the ground was enough for me. Welcome to Combat Story. I'm Ryan Fugit, and I served war zone tours as an Army attack helicopter pilot and CIA officer over a 15-year career. I'm fascinated by the experiences of the elite in combat. On this show, I interview some of the best to understand what combat felt like on their front lines. This is Combat Story. Today we hear our second combat story with a member of the Air Force's Aerial Special Operations Community, Mike Lefebvre, an MC-130 navigator in the Air Force's 8th Special Operations Squadron, or 8th SOS. Mike was deployed consistently from 2001 to 2006 with the 8th SOS as the most deployed Air Force Special Operations Squadron at the time. This included trips to both Afghanistan and Iraq as both the aircraft technology improved and bases in theater became more fortified and established. In the MC-130, Mike was responsible for a variety of mission sets, supporting primarily special operations community, including DevGru, as we hear in this episode. The MC-130 is designed to support the special operations community with airdrops, delivery and extraction of special operators, refueling, combat search and rescue, and so much more. In this episode, we pick up where we left off as Mike goes from his first deployment post 9-11 into the next and more established operational tempo, going from Afghanistan to Uzbekistan to Kuwait to Iraq and back again. And I hope you enjoy this set of combat stories in the versatile MC-130 as much as I did. Mike, thanks for coming back for round two with us, man. Oh, it's glad to be back. I've enjoyed a couple of episodes uh, since I was on, so. Excellent. Well, for people who hadn't seen or listened to the first round, um, I wanted to catch them up. And we left off with you kind of coming out of your first deployment post 9-11 in what we described as kind of the Wild West. Wild and I know West, what we're going to yeah. do is go through kind of some more established um, operations with bases that actually have fences around them and, and proper security and that sort of thing. But for people yeah. who didn't tune into the first one, can you just give us a recap of your background, how you got to that place? And then we'll jump off from there. Yeah, so retired in 16, Lieutenant Colonel, U.S. Air Force, uh, grew up out in Oregon and Washington, went to the University of Washington uh, in ROTC, straight into the military, Did some. Uh, eventually I found my way to flight school four or five years in, and then ended up in MC-130Es, which are the combat talents like we discussed the last time. So for your new listeners, C-130s that are say, heavily modified to support uh, special operations um, and the first real special operations C-130 platform in the, in the service, um, you know, history back to the... And the in that first, that first interview, you go in-depth in, into kind of the parameters, the configuration, the mission set of the MC-130. So if people want to hear that, definitely check that out. I mean, it's a first-person perspective of someone who's been inside it and knows all about it. But also the other thing we wanted to touch on here was K2. So I wanted to tee that up. Yeah. So, you know, for those that weren't, weren't on the last time or weren't listening last time, I, we ended, as we ended my first deployment, we had, we had moved, our unit moved from Pakistan to Uzbekistan because of weather. Basically our aircraft was capable of flying in some, in some difficult weather situations and the other uh, AFSOC unit wasn't, so we swapped bases. They went down to the warm weather in Jakobabad, and we went to the cold winter weather up in Uzbekistan. And the base we stayed at was this place called Karshikhanabad, Uzbekistan. It was a former Soviet air base. Um, and so, in the, I guess, basically in the run-up to deploying forces over to support Afghanistan, they, somehow the DOD identified this base, you know, did some some site survey type stuff and, and decided you know, worked with the government of Uzbekistan and decided to base troops there. And we were one of the, well, I should say our sister units were one of the first units there. But that's basically where um, White Soft, we talked about last week, was like the, the normal Green Beret soft teams that were supporting the Northern Alliance. That's where they were based out. So the horse soldiers, everybody knows the story about the horse soldiers. Those ODAs that were the horse soldiers, they were coming out of Uzbekistan. 
and we were there to support them. Well, that base turns out was a toxic waste dump from the Soviet era. Um, so, you know, everybody, you know, talks about how like we have environmental issues in the U S the Soviets, their idea of <laughs> environmental protection is, well, they didn't really have any ideas of environmental protection. Um, you know, the stories we heard were things like uh, they would, if they were changing the oil or the hydraulic fluid or something in one of their fighter jets or jets inside of the base, they would just unscrew it and just let it drain into the earth. So the ground wouldn't freeze. Uh, any standing water would turn green and purple. I mean, I have pictures, we have pictures of lakes and stuff there. It, it, it was a mess. And not only that, they, they found later, they're pretty positive. There was some, um, uh, so at some point during the Afghan, the Soviet Union's Afghanistan war, um, they put up a chemical, um, uh, what's those units that you guys have on the chemical defense units or whatever, the, the ones that do uh, the, the decan, decontamination, no, no, they put up the whole decontamination unit. And so there, there's pretty sure that some chemical weapons remnants were on that base and even some depleted uranium and maybe even some visible, some remnants of physical nuclear material. So uh, through the years, people have come on with some parody serious illnesses of about four or 5,000 of us that were stationed there. Um, in fact, there's a, uh, I would say the leading proponent in Cong Congress is a gentleman named uh, Representative Green out of Tennessee who was a night stalker. And he was stationed there too, along with some other guys. And then this foundation, uh, which is the Stronghold Fre Freedom Foundation, was formed by one of my uh, the enlisted gentleman I flew with uh, years ago, um, and he used it as a point and a way to advocate for all of us because so many of us came down with some serious either side effects or illnesses, mostly in the cancers and then some very serious, like I'd say, um, autoimmune or disorders. And and those of us that were there, you know, I'm lucky. I have I have some issues, but nothing very major out of it. Um, but I have friends that have passed away from cancer and, and the incidence rates from cancer and some uh, and some of these autoimmune disorders and other things going on are just out of, kind of out of control for that population group. Um, we've had some success. The foundation has had some success with uh, Congress and getting the VA to start acknowledging that because that was the that was the biggest thing. The VA wasn't wasn't acknowledging the illnesses or the causes of the illnesses. In fact, uh, I remember, you know vividly one deployment when we were coming home you have to you have to did you have to do a post-deployment health surveys before you yep. leave the theater? oh yeah yeah we all filled out our post-deployment health survey because we had you know they were finally inklings of all this junk on the ground and in the ground and oh oh by the way to build the walls at this base they dug up all the soil at one end of the air base and built berms out of it so they basically exposed everybody to that um, so we all wrote it in our post-deployment surveys and the docs handed it back to us and said, we, they won't let you leave the base if your surveys say this. So we had to no sanitize the survey. Yes. Oh. Um, yeah. So there's incidents of that going on and, you know, they, it, there's a, uh, I mean, you won't be able to see it because you have to have been stationed there, but there's a Facebook group. We all keep up with each other and they used to call it the K2 crowd. People would get sick for no reason. Um, and, and so even, even hospital. when you were posted there, you were starting to, to get some symptoms. Yeah. People, certain people would get sick from certain, certain others wouldn't, you know, it's, it, it, I hate to say it. I, I say it this way. We all would have like, I would have gone there no matter what, you know, Yeah, I would have served, I would have done the mission that just want people to be transparent with us and the government to be, you know, they, they could have said, listen, sorry, we have no other place to go. We need to operate out here. We'll do our best to, you know, you know, keep you safe and, you know, de-risk the situation or, you know, manage the risk. Um, but we'll put it in your records. And then if anything comes up, you know, we'll take care of you down the road. And yeah. They didn't really do that. So, so there was still fighting with the VA and Congress and, and trying to get that. So I just wanted to bring that up again because K2 is a prom prominent in my story and, um, you know, some of us that deployed, we didn't get shot at much, but we've, you know, our lives were affected in, in many other ways. And oh, I was yeah. just thinking before I came onto this, and you know, I, I think I've heard this said before. You, you would be an army guy, you could probably tell me better this way. But eighty percent of the combat, or eighty percent of the forces in the army, I believe, are logistics, right? They're the tail, and about twenty yeah. percent is combat. 
units, and then you throw the Air Force into that. And, and I don't think normal people get the the scope of that because everything that's lionized on TV is shooters. Yep. yep. Uh, the flyers, those of us that you know face combat in a more direct manner, um, and not all the support people, and how much how much effort goes in, goes into just getting one airplane in the air or one tank oh, on sure. the ground or yeah. one company of infantrymen yeah. on the ground. And, and it's not always those wounds from war don't always, are, don't always uh, affect the combat, just the combat. People, yeah. You know, just the people that are engaged in the fighting. So, Or even um, just the mental side, right? I mean, you're talking about some of the, these other health ramifications. And, and it, yeah, it does, and, like, I think before we kicked off, you mentioned it's almost like our Agent Orange, right? Where... Yeah, you know, we've heard yeah. a lot about that um, in the years from Vietnam. You know, my dad, my uh, father-in-law, and you know, we hear about this from their friends. Um, it's no joke, and it just sounds very similar. Yeah, and and you know what? It took what Agent Orange twenty plus years or something for them to get finally the VA to yeah. finally relent. And it, I think it took us it was about a year and a half ago, so would have been like twenty twenty one. So it took them like you know only a couple of years after around the same time as the war ended, but um, still, you know. For some people, it's too late. They're yes, they're past. You know, the passing of cancer. So, so with that life. in mind, I'm trying to remember, Mike. The first deployment you had, as you mentioned, like you're in Pakistan, you shift over to Uzbekistan. Um, you kind of see K2 for the first time. What's it like coming back from that first deployment for you, knowing you're on the kind of front end of this war? Well, so we we didn't, you know. With regards to like the K2 stuff, we didn't know at that. I mean, there was some, you know, I slept in a uh, Soviet um, uh, hard bunker for one of their fighter aircraft, uh, only for a couple of nights when I went up there for the site survey. But the unit that replaced us, they stayed in that thing all the time and they were getting sick. And there were even guys that just said, no more, I'm not sleeping in here. And they slept outside. So there was inklings of it from the get go. But I would say that, you know, it was just, it was kind of surreal. You know, you remember from the last story, I got married right before, you know, I got a, basically eloped before my deployment. We didn't know what we home to, like, let's go to a honeymoon. And and basically, mm-hmm. you know, the first six months of marriage, which for most people is pretty, uh, you know, it's just a pretty fun time. But I would say the war was still going on. And yeah. so, you know, I, I came home and, you know, Married life, and then I would say our our squadron kind of reconstituted in a slight way because the reserves came in and, and backfilled us for the next like sixty to ninety days because um, they were activated, fully activated by that point, um, and we had deployed pretty much the whole squadron to kick off the war. So we kind of phased. I mean, everybody didn't go back at the same time. We we phased everybody back because we would be turning around and rotating right back. So you know we we got home. Family life was good. You know, that was more of just getting used to being with my wife again. Or, yeah. You know, and then um, in the squadron, I say we kind of settled into what became steady state operations for the for the next five years, which was you know a cycle of like on you know come off for four or five months. Each crew position was a little bit different based on manning. So the radio operators and the engineers, the two enlist, those two enlisted crew fields, they got hosed for the next five years. They were on sixty off sixty days, able to some variation yes. on 90 off 90 um and then to pet my the nav position we had a few more bodies so our pattern was like four to six months between um cycles so for the next four four to six months i, I went home i took some leave went back to the squadron and then we were training and and supporting all the uh you know when i showed up at that unit our we had a pretty robust deployment cycle anyways training all our training was cycled in the 90 days, you know, um, joint special operations cycle. So there was all sorts of events yeah. that happened every 90 days. So, and you were on alert. We were, we still had those mission sets were still there. So we still had to maintain, you know, as soon as we got home, when the unit got back up and two, you know, two crews were into work, then, you know, it was like we had to maintain a certain number of crews to support that mission set. So it was just back to, work as normal with you know with the eye on the ball of like hey we're going back and and if we got guys over there what are we doing to help those guys over there yeah. to, you, know, you know people asking for parts or equipment or support from back home um, you know all the then, tier one 
the tier one folks we've interviewed on this program, like when they're back, they're constantly training and shooting yeah. and jumping and, and going around the world. And, and you're, you're the We're doing the same thing. Them. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah you're, you're a big capability for, so, you know, you know, those guys have a dedicated cycle, whereas AVSOC supports all the mission sets. So you're yeah. not just doing that. You're doing what, what these things called J sets, which are joint combined training. So you might, I mean, they, they tampered a lot of it down during that time because they just couldn't. They just had it. to. Because, yeah. yeah. But, you know, normal ops, you might be heading down to South America or Central America to do a, you know, a joint training mission with Green Berets and the Colombian military. Or, you know, if you're overseas, you might be doing that in Europe with one of the militaries in Europe or, you know, in Asia. Um, in the state side, you're doing things like flying up to Fort Campbell for a week and, and doing Hilo AR training with the 160th. And we still yeah. did that stuff. We still deployed and went TDY. We didn't, we didn't do it as much, but we still, we still did that. Um, so you're so doing not a lot of downtime for, is what you're saying for the no, next five and, years. And you're, yeah, no, not a lot of downtime for the next five years. And I said in, in the last interview, you know, we were, that was the start of being the most deployed unit in the United States Air Force for six, six years right. So, it, and then you put that other cycle and, and we won't even get to it. I, I'll just mention that in that six years, I also went to Haiti for a couple of weeks because there was a Haiti, uh, you know, an intermittent Haiti uh, mission. And then, you know, uh, I think we got put on alert a couple of times for for some uh, hostage rescue missions down in Colombia because there was still the FARC was still big and there yeah. were still American hostages and stuff down there. So those other mission sets popped up every now and then, and some of the guys got to go do them, and some of us, some of us didn't. But you know, those were always there. And then at at some point in that cycle too, in those four or five years, um, the JSOC uh, JSOC went back to its full training schedule. So then we would have those big exercises twice a year with them. Uh, they usually had it once a quarter, but the whole package usually, you know, like the, the, there's they're quarterly, but some quarters are bigger than others. So I, I, yeah. that way. I don't want to get too far into the weeds and get myself in trouble. Um, Got it. So then you have all those training missions and off you go. So that was, you know, back to work. And then uh, that summer of 04, I deployed again uh, back to at, Back to K2, back to Afghanistan, got to see K2 in the summertime. Not a lot went happened. I would say the best way to summarize that deployment is it was uh, getting used to just static everyday operations in Afghanistan. Um, what is that like? What do you mean by that, Mike? Well, so a lot changed between when I left and when I got back. And the biggest incident, I would say, is Anaconda happened in March. So I got back at the end of January, Anaconda happened in March. And that was really the introduction of, you know, up to the point I left, it was a sophomore. So, and I firmly believe that if it would stay that way, probably wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. Um, But I can't, you know, you can't get around the politics of big army and the government, military contractors and all that stuff. And who knows, who knows how that decision was made or driven, but that was the big change. You know, it became, it went from the wild west, as we were saying, and our true software by through and with, you know, partner forces to big army. Um, you know, and I don't even think we had RCs or any of that stuff then. Um, but that was like the beginning of all of that. Our RCs um, being like the big regional commands, right? Commands, like RC yeah. East and South. Yeah. South. And yeah. It, it, it was still kind of just Bagram and Kandahar and, um, so when I say steady state operations, it was like same types of missions we were flying before, but a lot more consistent. So the the pace wasn't as high, um, and the mission sets were a, a lot of just trash, you know, hauling people around that in, you know, saw a lot of, like I said before, saw a lot of, you know, mail missions, cash missions, and then just, uh, building up bases. So flying a lot of equipment and into those places like Chapman um, yeah. where you were stationed here, where they slowly just built up those ODAs, and ODBs into those big operations. And then, um, and then we kind of started some of the, I wouldn't say we did a lot of the hit missions that, that one, it was just a lot of more just resupply. And that's when, I want to say big army was starting to really build up a lot of bases. So soft kind of had some bases in the big army was starting to build up their stuff. You had um, did, did you not do an OIF rotation before that, Mike? Like no, because? no. So my OIF rotation is the next one. So O O one, and then O two. You know, basically went back in June or July. So I went. Mm-hmm. I had maybe three months at home, four months at home, 
and then um, was home again for 60 days or so, basically for Christmas, and then went back for OIF in like January or early February. And that's um, that we can talk about more. So yeah. once again, bigger package again, um, squadron was split. I went with the white soft package to Kuwait. The rest of the squadron went, you know, the other chunk of the squadron went. This time we deployed in concert with the reserves. So we think we had, I want to say we had three crews, three or four crews from our squadron and two crews from reserve, something like that. And then the package that supported went and elsewhere that supported Black Soft or J JSOC had more reserve crews and less of our crews. Um, but we basically deployed almost at the same time. Um, we had, that was a bigger, that was a little bit different because that was, we almost, previously we just, we kind of deployed as a, what we call an air element and, and just so act an air component, joint special operations air component. Um, that time we, we deployed as a JSOTA, an actual task force. So the task force commander was was an air force colonel this time instead of an oh. colonel, but we had two, wow. yeah. So the task force commander was an Air Force colonel, and we had um, two battalions of Fifth Group Special Forces with us, and a, a platoon of SEALs. Um, and then the, uh, the uh, 53s, MH 53s from AFSOC, uh, and then um, our aircraft. Uh, the gunships were in theater and supporting, but they weren't in Kuwait at that point. They were flying out of it. They were part of. I think they were part of the task force, but they were flying out of a different airfield. Um, for the war, for the opening of OAF. And then we opened OAF, you know. So once again, you know, more you know, a junior flyer, but a senior captain at, you know, almost senior captain at that point. I ended up on the staff again in the this time I was at J35 plans inside the Jesotif. Um so when I talked last last time about me, you know, helping Chris Miller, Miller's team out on the ground, the, the gentleman who was the acting secretary of defense for a while, he was he ended up being the the S3 for the battalion, the fifth group battalion at that point, you know, two years down the road. So he and I uh, kind of bonded over that. Hey, I, I was the guy, one of the guys that helped pick, you know, pick up all your wounded. And he was like, well, thank you for that. You know, we'll be good friends now. And um, that was where I learned, like, there's so much variance and difference in officers and in the services. Like he was the greatest guy to work with. Um, if you told him there was a limitation on weight or, or we couldn't do, you know, we couldn't do A because of X, Y, Z. He would go to his teams and he would figure out a way to make it work. Whereas the other battalion command, uh, the other battalion S3 was always like, no, no, I can't ask my guys to lose 2,000 pounds. Well, we can't fly your Humvees in if they weigh 2,000 pounds more. You know, it, it, it was always a fight with him. And Chris's motto was like, I've got three or four extra teams sitting around that aren't going in. So, you know, like I'll make it a contest to see who can get the lightest and the lightest 10 teams will get to go. In. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's awesome. And, and that's a little bit of a, I would say the lightest, but he, he, he would say like, you give me a weight limit, my team will, will be under the weight. Limit. So the, uh, you know, that mission set for that just sort of was predominantly um, support for the invasion. So uh, he planned several big ops that basically infilled them all those ODAs in various spots up and basically south or west of main lines of communication up into Baghdad. And those ODAs had a mission to go do our, you know, our uh, route surveillance, basically. They were the eyes and ears for the, for Big Army's push and into, um, to go up, you know, let's see, Big Army went kind of west, south and west where the Marine Corps went like direct towards Baghdad, or sorry, Baghdad. Um, so we put those guys out around that arc. Um, and then some of our aircraft supported um, some of the lar larger JSOC missions to go hunt for WMTs. Um, so really? there's some pretty good mission sets there. Um, as a staff officer, you know, the big things I learned there were, hey, coordination is important. So one of the best stories I think I have for that whole deployment was uh, getting a call from the special operations element in the air first night of the war, the AOC, the air operations center in uh, Saudi the Lieutenant Colonel calls me, Hey Mike, uh, somebody screwed up and they didn't deconflict the T lambs. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, there's, there's T lambs going across our air refueling routes. Um, so like missiles. Yeah. All the ship launched, uh, Tomahawk yeah. cruise missiles were, had ingress quarters at 500 feet co-altitude with our 
Hilo AR tracks where we were refueling all the helicopters to infill these guys on night one. So I'm on this frantic call with on the radio trying to get a hold of the you know the mission commander for that. And of course the mission commander's like calm and cool. Oh, we see him go over ahead. There's no worry. Yeah, we already saw him, Mike. We didn't need you to tell us about it. You know, like they're five hundred, a thousand. We're we're refueling it, you know, we're we're down lower than that. Don't worry. I'm like, okay, great. What? You know, but yeah, so I mean they just they just went lower. They were going to go low anyways because they didn't they didn't know what the threat was. Um, we didn't know how the Iraqis would respond. The Iraqis actually had some some top you know frontline yeah Warsaw packed gear and some French and some Swedish and some other gear as far as um, anti aircraft systems. Mm-hmm. So um, you know we would normally refuel helicopters like five hundred or thousand feet. So they went a lot lower. They went as low as they could go, basically safely to refuel. They did a mid air refuel below five hundred feet. Is that what you were saying, Mike? Yeah, yeah, with helicopters, it's it's a little bit different. It's jeez, it still sounds so it's, pretty dicey. Yeah, but I mean, come on, helicopters can fly like two feet. <laughs> That's true. That's it's true. not dicey when you have all that terrain falling equipment. <laughs> you can train for it and you fly for it. So when you said you were in the the air ops center. The, the night that the war kicked off. Can you give us... Well, I wasn't in the... I wasn't in the AOC. And I was in our, our center. So okay. the AOC, guy, the, the SOUL guys, it's called the SOUL, the special operations element, just like the army element. You know, what, what's it called? The ground coordination element or whatever. Um, Air operations center. I've been in an AOC before. Well, after it's just, you know, it, 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 it looks like one big, large control room that everybody's there so they can deconflict everything. And all of that, we talked about that before. All of that's supposed to get in the, the air tasking order. Those those TLAM corridors were supposed to be in the ATO. Somehow they got left out. Um, slightly they would important. Have been in the, yeah, slightly important. If they would have been in the ATO, then our guys would have known they were there. Our guys had kind of naturally de- deconflicted themselves anyways because they they had you know they had their block to a certain altitude. Well, they were flying at the bottom of their block because yeah. you know they they didn't want to go zipping over like a. Uh, I can't remember what that, what's that? Uh, it starts with an R. I can't remember. Uh, it's a Swedish or a, a French. Um, sorry. Sam it kind of, oh, it's, it's, Sam, like a, uh, oh, it's a mobile SAM system. You, you probably think of it or I'll think of it, but it, it, you yeah, know, the nickname uh, starts with an R, but it's, it's a wheeled vehicle with like basically like stingers on it. Something similar to stingers. So, uh, there were several of those reported down in the southwest around some of the airfields, and so that's what our guys were trying to stay. They didn't want. They didn't want to hop. They didn't want to surprise one of those things while they're flying at 120 knots refueling helicopters. Right. It's not the best place to be. You don't have a lot of momentum there, you know, to go defensive yeah. at that point. You know, so, um, I I just imagine being in any op center the night that that war kicked off must have just been chaotic to some degree and it's it, it is and it isn't and i'll tell you the reason why it isn't is the reason why i didn't ever find it chaotic is because you know we we practice and train so much and we fly those missions so much and at that kind of execution level at a jasota for a jasoac there's really not a lot of command and control that that, that unit's doing it's more it's it's to put it in a good way it's more it's not even really the train and equip. It's just really the equip piece of it. Yeah, it's like yeah. enable that unit to go do their mission. Once once they launch into their mission, there's not much you could do. I was probably the most frantic when I got that call and ran to the radio, you know, operator. But other than that, everybody's doing their paperwork for the next day. So that's the thing about it. People don't realize that too. Like, well, they're out flying a mission. All the staff guys are handling all the paperwork that's generated and the tasking orders and requests. Um, we're a finite resource. So there's a whole bureaucracy base built around, even though that was, I said that, hey, those battalions were right there next door to us. In the same building, you can walk down the hall and coordinate. They still had to fill out a piece of paper and give it to me. Yeah. So, and then I still had to prioritize it and give it to the units so that they could decide, tell me which missions they could do, what ones there were valid. You know, so that whole process has to go on for the next night, the next night, the next incident. You know, it's a 24 hour cycle that continues ad nauseum until, I mean, it continued for what? Yeah. 20 plus years. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
So not yeah. not as eventful, kind of consistent off tempo based out yeah. of so I mean, for but that it was a, now it was OIF and um you know the only other really good stories I have from that um is A, I had eight eighteen alarm reds or alarm black, and not alarm reds, which are basically missile launches at Kuwait. Sodom still had scuds. And so there were he was launching missiles at us. And of course, we were the prime target right there in Kuwait, the two air bases in Kuwait. So we were running towards the bunker a lot. So we got into that point where uh, I used to go to, and I slept during the day. I was working at nights. Most of the missile attacks seemed to happen during the day. I think we had one land within maybe two miles of the base. It was just pieces because the Patriots took it out. But every time one of those alarms went out, you get woke up. You're playing fireman with your chem gear. It got to the point where all of us were pretty much just wearing our tennis shoes and our PT gear in bed. And then you take your cam gear and roll it down like a fireman. And you just, instead of wearing your combat gear, you, you just throw your, slide your tennis shoes into your, you know, your rubber booties and put your chem gear on, go run and go run. And we got away from going to the bunkers because right about the same time, they came out with some, some oh, Air Force civil engineer unit um, or, you know, somebody somewhere had done a study and they realized that um, it's a heck of a lot better to be inside a building than a bunker if you're, going to be in a chemical weapons environment um so we stopped running to the bunker everybody just always ran to the building so you just ran to your work just ran to your workspace yeah <laughs> um and um so you'd run to your workspace sit down and um you know if it happened at night when i was in my workspace the uh the guy that sat to my left in my workspace in the g35 plan shop uh, was the, our liaison to the space space world um, an Air Force guy. And so he was getting all the chats from the space guys at the KAOC. He was getting all the alerts before base would get the alert. So we were always like two minutes ahead of getting dressed into our gear anyways. <laughs> okay. um, so that was about the most traumatic thing. I think we rapidly figured out, um, like I told you last trip, last talk, they rapidly figured out that was first that first month in Iraq that um there wasn't a lot of threat except from small arms. And so as a tactic set, we just started flying high pretty much by the end yeah, of that. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing, you know, I'll see from that deployment is I had, I had a friend I went to college with who was a skid pilot in the Marines. So you can do H ones in the Marines. And I'm sure I know you're aware of this, but the Marine helicopter units are integrated. So, especially the skid units, you have UH-1s and Cobras, and, and we ran into each other somehow, or I, I knew his unit was on on uh, on the same base as us, and um, so we got to reunite. We hadn't seen each other in four or five years. Um, but that happened because one of his Cobra squadron mates came over looking for some help with some intel, because they didn't have the best intel suite, and was able to help the Cobra unit out, got them into uh, into our Intel shop and skiff and got them some high res, um, some, well, some better resolution pictures of their target areas because they were flying in an urban environment and they didn't, they didn't have Intel to, to tell them what potentially was on the other side of a building. Cause that's what mm -hmm. they were doing. They were scooting, uh, hopping and scooting over buildings to, to help the, uh, Marines out in the urban areas. So, so helping my, brethren out that was really an interesting experience to see you know like how the other side lives in the yeah nation. that the marines really do stuff without a lot of support um, yeah so that that was really nice to be able to help someone else than us mm -hmm. um, and then for other sure. than that you know it, that that went on for a while and then eventually near the end of it i actually got to go fly um at the last month or so um like I said, most deployed squadron in the Air Force at that time, like we're in our second and two and a half, third year. And one of my, uh, so I swapped with a guy to stay because I didn't have any kids and he was, he had been gone a long time and he had been in the squadron, a different squadron that was the most deployed squadron um, in the late 90s and early 2000s during the whole Balkans thing. So he was, he had been remote, like in the two most deployed squadrons back to back for like oh, six yeah. years. So he was fraud by the time. Uh, by the time that first OAS stretch ended, he was fried. So went and flew in the uh, flow or went and got to fly with a reserve unit. It was a nav and um, got to fly Rumsfeld into this, into Bagram. Um, wow. So he came down and flew, flew into Bagram on uh, 
I think, on our aircraft. Um, so that was a big uh, dog and pony show. Obviously, you know, we flew it in, and all, you know, there was F-15s, you know, as top cover for us, and all sorts of you know fun stuff that we got to coordinate for that. And then that was that was uneventful. I mean, we landed and we sat on the yeah. ramp um, for like he was there for like four or five hours or more. So we flew up, we sat on the ramp at Diagram. We drove over to one of Saddam's castles. We got a tour. The, I think it was the third battalion of fifth group had taken over one of the castles as their command center. So we went and hung out and had lunch with them, and toured the thing. And like, so I got like, a bunch of pictures of me, you know, like, like gaudy. That's gaudy awesome. Rooms. Um, and you can look those up on the internet, not yeah. myself, but I'm sure there's plenty of them up there. So, and then went home and was home again for, Oh, I lucked out. I, I got I was home for almost a year just because of some training things. And, you know, like I said earlier, when you go home, you have to, you have to keep progressing. So uh, in order to get in line to become an instructor and other stuff, there was some training things I needed to do. And then I was progressing in rank. So they were trying to set me up for a major's promotion board, give me a different job in a different squadron for a little while. Um, and then went to KT in the winter of 04, back to the routine of Afghanistan. Um, which at that point was our, our squadron at that point settled into mostly Afghanistan support and a couple of the other squadrons in, were, were doing Iraq. Um, and that's kind of how it split out, just like the army kind of split out. Mm -hmm. Army, army took Iraq, Navy took Afghanistan or in the, in the soft world to some extent, not the, the white soft, but the black soft world chasing, chasing different targets. And then, um, uh, did some interesting things that winter though. So the, the the interesting things we did is I got to drop one of the first uh, GPS guided parachutes um, in a test for that was uh, in a test for one of the JSOC units was actually testing that capability. So we we uh, got to play with that, which was really cool. So it was treated almost like a, a halo or a hey-ho drop, you got up to a certain altitude and drop the load out the back and shoot could steer itself. It did a pretty good job. So that was interesting. And that's that's pretty much a uh, common day capability across the Air Force now. It's GPS guided um, platform, you know, so they can put a GP GPS steering rig that can pull the toggles basically and steer the shoot. How, so, but, so prior to that, Mike, what would the, a similar drop have been without that technology? Well, so what that technology allows you to do is drop something from a bigger standoff just because it had it, it could kind of glide for longer glide, and you wouldn't right. have dropped See, something at that altitude without that capability no, because the wind the wind's too variable and you would miss the drop you know your room for error is much much worse so you know to really drop be precise with that kind of load so basically the heavier the load you're dropping the higher you got to go to drop it so we're talking like you know, a thousand to two thousand feet in normal operations to drop just a big pallet of equipment. And, yes. and with this, you could be offset and and go up to a, yeah. a significant altitude now. Yeah, and the reason why they were testing this capability was we were doing that. We did, I think, one or two rehearsals during that deployment with uh, with Navy Soft, um, and it was the it was the UBL mission. They were rehearsing at that time. They thought UBL was somewhere in the you know, just over the border in Pakistan. So the whole mission set was for us to drop them um, this side, you know, in inside Afghanistan territory and let them glide to their DZ. Yeah. So Halo, basically, the, or Halo, Halo, whatever they were going to use, they were going to jump at altitude, glide to their DZ in Pakistan. And they want, they were looking at the capability to drop maybe, you know, a couple pallets with potentially, I guess, either small vehicles, you know, like four wheelers or, or just equipment or support equipment, whatever they needed to, to, to be able to go in and operate and go after UDL. So we, we did some rehearsals in Afghanistan, basically that mimicked where they thought they needed to, to go do this. And, you know, and as everybody now knows that mission happened later, they did it a different way, but, yeah. um, <laughs> but doesn't mean you weren't practicing all this. Yeah. And, and oh my goodness! Oh, go ahead, Alan. I, well, I was going to ask: Would it land in like that GPS device? Would it allow it to land in a, in a pretty fixed uh, yeah, location, I mean, or was it still kind of a hundred meters plus or minus? Yeah, I mean, it just depends. I mean, like I said, that was the very beginning, one of the very 
those tests. They did tested it stateside. Mm-hmm. Then they were, you know, like, like we talked, I don't know if other people have talked about this, but you know, SOCOM, JSOC, they have they have a lot more flexible ability to develop equipment. Yeah. And so that thing that I got to test, we tested it again at home a couple, couple, you know, years later. Um, and then now it's dropped. I mean, you go Google it, you can see videos of it on YouTube now out of normal C130s and stuff. But That's so awesome. It's a lot more accurate now. That whole system, when we tested it, it was kind of convoluted. You had there was a process you go to to try and determine the winds because it is still wind dependent. You couldn't, you know, you know, when you're dropping from a thousand feet, you can use a forecasted wind, and if it hits the left side of the DZ instead of the right side of the DZ, no big deal. Um, but if you drop in from altitude, uh, you know, I had a buddy tell me a story once where the wind shifted on him on a halo drop and, and the guys he would, that he was in Europe in the eighties, I think, or early nineties, and he was dropping, uh, a partner soft unit and they missed the whole peninsula of the country. They were oh. yeah. So instead of landing on the one side of the peninsula, they landed on the other side because the wind shifted and they couldn't do anything. So they ended up missing the whole country. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but you can't, you know, you can't, there's no, you know, there's no real good way to measure winds aloft, you know, unless you're doing balloons. So we were using sensors. We were dropping specific types of sensors out of the aircraft to try and get the winds so that we could get, you know, narrow our drop window. Because you, with that kind of equipment, you're dropping in a, you drop it in a bucket instead of a pinpoint. And when you're dropping mm-hmm. over a DZ, you're dropping on a pinpoint because you're only, you know, like the the highest ever drop from over a normal drop so it's like a couple thousand feet. Yeah. So so it's a really cool capability. I was one of the first guys to get to play with it. And it was interesting. You could see the utility of it. It it didn't get used in the it, it may have gotten used later. I have no clue, but you know, we just tested it. It still needed some work and it went they went back home and eventually obviously eventually it worked. It's yeah. Um, it hit the real world, you know, five or six I don't, I wouldn't even say yeah like I think by eight, eight or nine, it was starting to get more more popular for all sorts of units. So um, that was that deployment. Came home, um, went back to OIF to Kuwait in the summer of 05. Just a quick thanks to our sponsor, HelloFresh, and we'll get right back to this combat story. We love HelloFresh in our family. We've used it for over three years to prepare delicious meals for our family of five at least three to four nights a week. And we were avid users long before they sponsored us. These meals are so easy to prepare and it feels like you're actually making a real meal that you might get at a restaurant. Some meals can be prepared faster than others in case you've got a night of shuttling kids or family around and don't have much time to cook. In those cases, we'll opt for something fast, but even the regular meals can be prepared easily and in very little time, getting a great tasting and healthy meal on the table every night. We love the different meal options. Some that we really enjoy are the honey butter barbecue pork chops, umami ginger pork bowls, the beef flautas supreme, and more. So go to hellofresh.com slash combat story 50, that's combat story 50, and use the code combat story 50 for 50% off plus free shipping. That's hellofresh.com slash combat story 50 and use the code combat story 50 for 50% off and get that free shipping. And now, back to combat story. This was a real big deployment. I think we were there for almost four months. Um, it was the surge, if you, if you remember right. The, yeah. You know, the Fallujah, the Karbala, all that stuff. Um, you know, we came in, the, gun, the gunships were going Winchester every... So we, we were back in Kuwait. The gunships were stationed right next to us. We were in one building there and their building. They were flying every night. They were going Winchester every night. Um, that's where, that's, I think, where if you read the stories, you know the stories, it's the Marines loved that platform. Oh, yeah. Um, and I'm sure the Army, everybody in those. Everybody those loves stories. that platform. Yeah, in an, especially in an urban environment. Um, so our primary mission there was flying Iraqi soft all over theater. Um, and they were moving them all around. So we were all all over Iraq. Al-Assad, uh, you know, Tal Shar, Car- um, we didn't really go into Fallujah, Karbala, or that stuff too much. We didn't. We weren't flying aircraft into those. Well, Al Assad um, was north of the, kind of that corridor, so we were going people out there, I and mean, we were still taking people up north to like Karbala and um, Missoula too, because there was stuff going on up there. And so we were moving those soft units around so that the 
um, by Iraqi soft to be involved in those fights. Um, I did a lot of uh, psychological operations for that mission. That set we dropped a lot of leaflets. Nice. Um, so we got to, we got to uh, litter all over uh, a lot of towns. In Iraq, are you ever mostly. are you ever involved in like? Um, was there any anything beyond dropping them? Like, did you have to kind of understand no, we what was being them. dropped, or is it just like we don't ask? No, but put it in the bag. We don't add. Well, the, the, those units are part of the Jesotives, so. Wherever they're stationed, you know, they just, they create the, the product and they bring yeah. it to you. Um, I don't need to know what's on the product. I just need to know what kind of paper it is because the paper, interestingly enough, we have, you know, paper falls at different speeds and velocities. Some of it does this, some of it spins. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. So depending on the weight and the type of paper, they have, you know, you, you, you help use that to calculate your drop point and then. You want to drop up wind, obviously, and you want to drop a certain altitude. So the most interesting drop I did for a psychological drop was there is we had to actually, the town we were dropping on was literally next to the Syrian border and we couldn't fly in Syria. So we had to modify. And, and of course, the way the winds were out of the west to the east, the ideal drop location was, of course, in Syria. So you can't drop in Syria. Um, and they were pretty, pretty strict about the rules. It wasn't like the Vietnam days where people Oh yeah, we flew over Vietnam. No, yeah. they, they, we weren't going to get in trouble, so we had to like do this crazy maneuver where we came in a lot lower than we would normally do. We decided the best thing we could do is come in lower at one corner of the town and then in, start a climb, and then like bank over the town and hope that that got everything up in the wind enough that it would like go across the town at an angle instead of blanketing the whole town or something. I don't know. I, you know, I don't know how good that stuff uses. We always joke that, you know, just dropping the enemy toilet paper. Um, <laughs> cause, cause they're that kind of size, you know, it's yeah. like, it just, you're just throwing a bunch of trash at them, but I, it's got to work because in some way or shape or form, but I'll tell you what, it makes a mess of the airplane. It, it yeah. makes an absolute mess of the airplane afterwards so that well now now we just send it over uh facebook and uh yeah, instagram emails, and yeah. whatnot yeah 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 you would know all about that wouldn't you just a different <laughs> medium yeah so did the old-fashioned way uh we look i'm looking at my notes here oh uh, oh and then our big mission that that one is we got flexed to bagram so uh during that so iraq I, deployment they would flex you to another theater and they flexed us to the other theater as wow. they needed. Um, so uh, a mission came up. I don't know if you remember this, but a uh, a contractor, the Taliban, not the Taliban, sorry. Yeah, Taliban, whatever you want to call them. Uh, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, whoever was in, Iraq, in Afghanistan at the time, they threw an American contractor off a cliff. Remember that? I don't know if you remember that. I, like I don't remember that. No. So they, they, threw a, they threw them off a cliff, basically. They, they took him captive and they threw him off a cliff. And um, I mean, let's just say they, our intel figured out where they were and they set up a mission to go do it. And they didn't have enough platforms in theater to do that mission with, without um, risking the day to day mission set and support that they needed one. So they basically flexed us from Afghanistan or from Iraq to Afghanistan to go support that mission. So we went there with the sole intent of supporting that mission. Um, and so we went into Bagram and we flew, I think we were there four or five days, and maybe a little bit longer. And we support, we all, all we did was support that mission set. So that yes. involves some, some Hilo AR support for infills and exfills. And then, um, we were supposed to take the strike team in, um, and our aircraft actually lost an engine halfway halfway into the mission and so we had to turn around so the strike team only went in with half half their force which is they, they still went they, in wow well they planned for that that's how they yep. break up their how they break up their teams and all that they build their mission so they can they can do things yeah so they still went in. oh um and they got the guys and and that was that and and then we went back to back to oif and they, spe that, so. speaking of losing an engine how hectic is that in the cockpit when that's going down so one engine, it's hectic, but I mean, you practice that stuff all the time. So one engine is not a big deal in a Herc. It can easily fly on three. You can't really do your mission set, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, usually 
usually it starts with something like it either just goes or it starts with something like the engineer says something, hey, the, the oil pressure is wobbling on this one or what should we get to watch this one? And then you know, three minutes later, it's like, yep, there it goes. Okay, we got to shut down number three. All right, shut down number three. All right. And then it's at that point, you know, pilots, you know, hopefully the mission commander or the aircraft commander makes sure one of the pilots is flying the plane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then the other guy, you know, then the other one, me and the engineer handled emergency procedures. And then, you know, you got a good radio operator, they'll immediately report it. And then, you know, then we made our decision. And, you know, we had you already pre planned kind of your no go no criteria in your risk planning, your risk management planning that this incident happens. What's, you know, what's the status? Or is this something where we push on? Is this something where we, you know, I, I would say if we were flying a guy into like a big airfield like Kandahar probably would have pressed and just you know landed there and if there were hooks there have have a hook you know some other yeah. maintenance you take a look at it but in this case we were we were flying them into some place that there wasn't any maintenance or support so it's like okay we can't do that we're we're out we're we're, going, we're turning back with our tv um, now two engines that's dicey so i've never never had that happen with this so, had a friend happen to him. Um, I won't steal his thunder if you ever he ever gets a chance to talk okay. to him because his story is really cool. <laughs> um, you know, so it just depends. Um, and the last kind of thing about OIF, uh, that, that deployment is, uh, first off, that was a great crew. Uh, I flew with that, basically that crew, my last two deployments. Um, what what so, made him so good, Mike? Like what makes a good crew in that cockpit? Well, good crew... I would say a good crew in any cockpit, you kind of have to have some natural synergies. You know, you got to get along and you got to be a good mix of people. You can't all be the same types and qualities of people. So each of those deployments, I had a brand new navigator with me. So I was the, at that point, I was the experienced navigator. Um, so it was always, our squadron role was always really good about mixing an inexperienced guy with an experienced guy. So you'd have an experienced aircraft commander with an inexperienced co-pilot, or you'd have an inexperienced aircraft commander. When I say inexperienced aircraft commander, a newer aircraft commander, yeah. still quite experienced, but with like a, a higher time co-pilot. Um, you know, two same level navs, and you have an experienced nav and a new nav. Um, I would just say that, the, you know, we were technically whatever they called crew four. Um, and um, I'd say the biggest reason why we were good is we just all got along. We just all fit, you know, culturally well together. Um, the other thing you get to at that point in that in that cockpit, there's so much talking going on that that aircraft was very intensive about communication. And we all communicate well. Um, and we when you're living, breathing, eating, flying, training with the same people over and over and over again, you just, you get to a certain point. And, and why I say that crew was the best is um, I could, I had a private, we had a very unique intercom system. So we had private intercom channels. So the load masters had their own private intercom. The, two, the radio operating Evo had their own private intercom. The NAV had his own private intercom. And then the the pilots didn't, but the pilots had access the different um, privates. So it was standard procedure for the pilot flying the aircraft to have the nav intercom pulled up and listen to our conversation. So we were in the deep, in the depths of flying. You could be running a, you know, the left navigator could be running a checklist with the engineer, which involves the whole crew. Pilots are flying the airplane and having their interplane conversation going on. Um, the load masters are doing their thing on their private. You can't hear them. You know, the evil and radio operator are doing their things. But myself sitting as a more experienced nav in the right seat, you know, I'm keeping the airplane from, as I said before, from hitting the ground. I've got the radar. I'm working the radar. But I could, you know, it's never, you're never supposed to do this in the aircraft, but I can talk to my pilots by their first name. Or we can recognize each other's voices. So you wouldn't even have to say the name. I could just say, come left two, 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 or whatever heading I wanted the pilot to go to to refine something, and the plane would just move because he knew my voice, and I knew his voice. Or how were you supposed to, to do that? Like you said, you're, you're not supposed, supposed to, be to like, do that. It's supposed to all be very formal. Pilot, right nav, come left two. You know, you're supposed to do it on the, the open intercom system, the whole intercom system, so everybody on the plane is hearing everything. But when you've got five radios going, 
That's a lot. All the yeah. conversations I mean, that's crazy. That. And then you've got the checklist running and then the pilot's trying to fly the plane. And when does the checklist run? When did you run your checklist? You know, you always run your checklist in the most intensive, busiest parts of the mission. Yeah. <laughs> you're not yeah. running your checklist at altitude, you're doing nothing. No. You're running them on approach. You're running them up or in the run up to a drop. You're running them, you know. Um, so it, it just the ability to be able to to basically just be able to do your job. And it was almost like the Everybody was an extension of everyone else. I guess yeah. that was the best bit, you know. And you could, and then like I could, I could anticipate what the pilot pilot was going to do next. He could anticipate what I want him to do next. And yeah. So, and both the pilots, I'd say the co-pilot and pilot. and I flew with that pilot, that co-pilot, and that engineer, both loadmasters. I want to say I think that crew was almost fully intact. I had two different maps, um, but otherwise it was. Do you think, it, just as you mission. mentioned, how, how many crew are required to keep that thing going? Nine. I mean, is that, do you, do you think we will see a day where that is autonomous? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're, you're I mean, the new MC-130J has um, no engineer, no radio operator. I think it's got a crew of six. So, so they're already pilot, starting to one navigator and two load masters. And they I think they augment it with this, they might augment it with a second nav or a second or a third load master. Because on the new J models, there's no engineer. So that and the load masters have some of the duties of the engineer taken over some of the duties of the engineer. There's certain mission, mission sets where you want an extra pair of eyeballs or two in, in the cockpit. So I'm sure they augment that, but yeah, like a basic crew is like six. So they locked three off. The the other plane, the combat town two, I think had a crew of eight. So they had already locked one position off that that plane. No two. They had one, two, three, four, five, six. No, it was a crew seven. Sorry. So they had locked two off from yes. the first talent to the second. Now I will tell you, I firmly believe because of the way our aircraft was designed and operated and how much the crew had to interoperate and talk to each other, that it kept us safe. Our sister squadron crashed three or four aircraft. We're not a sister squadron, but our sister community crashed four, you know, had four aircraft crashes in that, in that stretch of time. Um, one, two in combat, two in training. And I, I, yeah, that's, I was wondering, Mike, how, what is a crash like typically there? Is it because maybe the person doing the terrain following radar isn't, isn't looking at what he should be? Like, what's causing one of those crashes? So, uh, you know, Three of those crashes were, I should say, three crashes in combat that I know of, and if I'm thinking right. And, and that was one of those crashes wasn't that, was a different community. As I told you last time, there were three communities of, of MCs. Um, one, one um, two of those, two of those were CFTs, control flight in the terrain. Um, so basically pilot error. Or crew error, let's not say pilot error, crew error. Um, one of them then it, it was a training and nav deficiency. That was one that happened in training. Another one that happened in training. Um would also they flew in a train, but I I think that one was crew error also, but there was some um, extenuating circumstances with weather that added to the, the mishap. Um and then um one wasn't the crew's fault at all. Um the army actually caused the accident. The uh, the airfield operations at our airfield in, in Iraq didn't put a notum in that that the first three thousand feet of their airfield were under construction. And oh so my crew, gosh! And the crew landed on brick yeah. one, and then about two thousand feet down, the aircraft just kind of suddenly came to a massive stop and ripped up the aircraft and hurt some crew members because there was a big hole, and they hit the hole. Wow. So there was supposed to be a notum about a displaced threshold. They were supposed to land on. Yeah. And, and a notum, so, if we didn't cover it last time, a notice to airmen, notice right? Here. So it's yeah. th this is like there's construction going on. There's a tower being built. There's something going yeah. on that you need to know about as pilot yeah. or as a crew member. Yeah, as as yeah, as an air crew, as air as someone flying into this airfield, you need to know these things. Yeah, going on at this airfield. yeah. So they neglect to put that notum. Yeah. Um, so that one wasn't the crew, error, but uh, you know most. From my experience, just why just in the air force in 20 plus years, most of the incidents were that I saw were um 
or that you know were briefed to us when we did safety and stuff. A lot of them were CFTs. Um, the technology today is so good that a lot of times it's it's a pile of crew error. Somebody makes an error and they they fly that thing to the background. I mean that's why I said I said it last episode. That's why I exist. That's why we existed as a right now. That was our whole job was to keep the aircraft from hitting the ground. So. We always used to say the probability, the probability of killing the ground is one. It's not quite one, but it's pretty darn close. Yeah. So, I mean, you've I've seen the videos of helos hitting trees and stuff. So a lot of that's like, oh, we can squeeze through there. So I've had that pilot say to me once or twice, I think we should, uh, you know, the good idea for it. We're going to do this. No, you're not going no. to do that. Not with me in this aircraft. <laughs> you're not going to do that. Uh. Um, yeah. So that was 05. Uh, Last bit about 05, I just wanted to tell you a, tiny, uh, a funny story about yeah. uh, 05. So that whole deployment in the desert, oh, I forgot. That started off, our that deployment started off with our first mission. We ended up going up to uh, um, Karbala, the big army base Karbala, and we landed there, and the engine, one of our engines just decided it was going to, I could swear, right? It, it shot itself all over. I mean, just oil everywhere. And so, um, you know, the there was no cranes on the base. There was no support. So we were basically stuck. And of course, multiple of us, first first, first mission back in theater, multiple of us in the, I think all of us forgot to bring, except for maybe one guy in the crew, forgot to bring our go bags. Um, so normally when we're in theater, we always brought a go bag with us, you know, with like a change of underwear, some clothes, some survival stuff in case if we get stuck someplace or if we crash, we have something to grab to run off the aircraft. And none of us brought our go bags. So we were, we had to go uh, go over to the BX and buy clothes. And then we got to go see this beautiful chow hall that KBR, you know, Kellogg Brown and Root built. And we were just intense. But we, uh, that was another one of those occasions where after my experience in in, in Kuwait the first time with all the, the uh, scuds flying at us, um, where I started to get ambivalent to rocket attacks, is there was a rocket launched at the base while we were sitting there one morning. And we were we were uh, staying in the uh, ODB's house, I guess they call it. We were staying instead of staying in just normal army tents. We were staying with the, the special ops guys. And the alarm went off, and we were all stuck in this one little room. And the, the aircraft kind of rolled over, and, and the co-pilot and like, "What are we going to do?" And all of us, we don't we don't have helmets with us. We don't have flak vests. You know, we had our aircraft gear, but we didn't have like our you know run out to the bunker gear. Yeah. And so somebody rolled over and said, "What should we do?" Someone else is like, I don't know, I don't want to get out of bed. And I think we all collectively decided that if a rocket was going to hit this building, oh, well. And we just all went back to sleep. <laughs> so like, it's been five years of this. We're good. Yeah, hey, we were good. And uh, that's where, you know, another time. So like, God bless the uh, counter artillery, you know, radars and, and defensive yeah, systems right. that the U.S. military builds. Because it was, you know, it was obviously they hucked a couple of rockets or mortars at the base and it didn't hit anything. You know, but so that whole story ends with um, the contractors going out into Karbala or wherever that town is, getting some sketchy crane to come in, you know, some, you know, Iraqi uh, entrepreneur that probably charges a lot more money for that crane than it was worth. And uh, and I think they, uh, they, I think the day prior or two days prior, someone had brought us up the, the oil cooler or the transmission or whatever, and a couple of mechanics joined us and they fixed the engine and we flew back. And that was a common occurrence. You know, occasionally you just did things like that. But that then started the funny occurrence. Uh, we killed more animals on that trip than I've ever experienced in our herd. So I think, yeah. So I don't know what it is about what it was about Iraq that summer, but every animal clue you can think of decided that the best place to be was the middle of the runway when we were taking off. So the surge, I, I don't, the surge pushed them all out of the city. Yes. Yeah. So I think we killed like one or two dogs, a couple bunnies. But the most interesting thing we killed at 18,000 feet was a bird. Oh, 18,000 feet. And it was a big, big bird. And it shattered it shattered the kick window. So the co-pilot's right by his right foot is a kick window that was one of the windows you use in our herb to look out to do airdrops. But shattered that window all over the glass, and it sounded like I mean, it sounded like uh, AAA when it hit the aircraft. 
Um, oh so, you know, of course, I, I guess I said this last one about somebody screaming like a girl. Again, the co pilot screaming like a girl. No offense, girls, but he's yeah. a little, little high pitched going on. And we're trying to figure out what the hell happened. And we're at 18,000 feet. Like, and we're under, way down south they of Iraq. Like, nothing's around. Yeah. Like, what the heck? Um, and we're, then we get back and they, they didn't identify the bird, which we still can't figure out why. And to this day, I, I, the only bird that I saw that was big enough to get to that altitude had a wingspan big enough in Iraq was flamingos. And I just can't, I just no. can't fathom a flamingo at 18,000 feet. But whatever it was, it was big. And I mean, how many birds get up to 18,000 feet? We just started our descent to Bagram. Like, yeah. What was so, the closest call you'd had below that, I guess, before you continue that? Like, the rest oh, like nothing. Clear. Nothing. Nothing. It's not even close. Nothing. Nothing. Like all, yeah, like all, like bird strike wise, always like on approach to an airfield or in a low level. Oh, birds, you know? Yeah. You know, and we in jet, I'm sure. I mean, the C 130 is like a propeller's just going to slice and dice birds. But yeah, I've had bird strikes before. Usually it's like little birds, but uh, not one that shattered a kick window. And so not only did it, was it, you know, not only was it odd to have a bird of 18,000 feet, it's, it had to be a pretty good sized bird. It's going to be cause the impact you know yeah to shatter a window i mean it, it hit just the right way to do it but yeah so yeah i think uh there was an ongoing joke and i think our crew chiefs somebody they started painting the animals on the plane too so on the side of the plane we had we had you know a bird and a dog I mean, they just started making a running oh. joke of it it's pretty pretty hilarious i've tried so. to imagine like coming back from that flight and somebody on the ground, like, hey, what the heck happened? Oh, we hit a bird at 18,000 feet. They're like, sure you did. What really we happened? Did. Yeah, well, there was, yeah, but there was blood all over the airplane. So, all right. Yeah, you know, you can't argue with the blood streak on the side of the uh, airplane. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. I was so, going to ask, you know, one of the things that comes to mind is you're flying this frequently. Like, you'll, you'll, you know, you mentioned you're sitting on the, on the tarmac for six hours while, Rumsfeld is at a meeting. You're flying from A to B, moving people. Yeah. You got ops going, and it's the same crew consistently. Um, how do you? That's a long time to be on and like dialed in and talking to other people. Like, how do you keep it light? Like, what are some of the things that happen in the cockpit? Well, oh my god, uh, people. Well, so uh, we always joke that we could write uh, almost a mash like comedies I bet. just on our yeah. Because the the creatures, you know, like, let's go back. I had, in my first deployment, I had an aircraft commander who was a vegetarian slash vegan um, that had insomnia. I mean, you know, so he's my, he's the best stick and he's my pilot and he's like that. And then on top of that, I've got a load master who's a college professor. I've got a flight engineer that is, uh, won't wash his flight suit. His one desert flight suit. Out of superstition, won't wash his flights. So his, we joked that his flight suit could stand up in the tent by itself by the end of the, you know, by the tour. And he stank. I mean, like, and this is just the, and then we had the guy living in our tent called Angry Bud. And our tent was the only tent that, you know, I hate to be, you know, speak ill of your, your fellow armyites, but the 10th Mountain Division is full of a bunch of crooks. You know, when we were in K2 the first time, 10th Mountain was sitting there and they were bored off their tea and, and, all the Air Force tents kept getting robbed. Um, you know, CDs you would go missing. Stuff, this, yeah. yeah, we have all the good stuff, right? <laughs> well, our tent never got robbed. And that's because Angry Bud, who was an engineer and was pissed at the world. Um, and like I said before, you know, when we were on post, Air, Air Force rules for firearms are really interesting. You carry your nine millimeter fully loaded one in the pipe because the Beretta is built to be carried that way. So the Air Force is a little more like logical about things. So I, I, we always thought that our tent didn't get robbed because Angry Bud was in it. And if anybody, and his was the first bunk in from the door. And if anybody walked into that tent at night while we were flying, there was going to be a nine mil stuck in space. Oh, um, you know, so yeah, humorous, a lot of humor, uh, a lot of things I I could say that's not, you know, not, um, not suitable PC. for work, not PC, yeah. not suitable for work. Um a lot of uh, body odors, purposeful oh, body bet. odors. Good God. Uh, purposeful eating of certain foods to cause purposeful body odors. Um, lots of jokes. I had a pilot, I won't say when, that had this penchant for having to go to the bathroom at the, at the you know, the, the most in, inopportune moment. Inopportune. Moments. Yeah. 
And so occasionally had to, you know, use the facility or use the lack of facilities uh, on the aircraft in flight or, or before flight. And so uh, he got uh, that, that coined the term, the Pooh Angel. Oh, no. What, what's an inopportune time? Is it like, like, or like a drone? No, like, uh, like we're just starting up for a big mission and he's like, is there a porta potty around here? And goes running off the aircraft to go find a porta potty. Oh, like, geez. You know, so you're talking about like uh, the humor is in that, but then there's also, you were talking about earlier, the psychological impacts of five, six years of straight operations being on and being off and being away from your family. Yeah. And I mean, I firmly believe he was having some sort of psychosomatic um, anxiety and it was triggering his need to go to the to, to, you know, yeah. to excavate his body. You know. So we all, and we all had our perks and intricacies. We played a lot of video games, watched a lot of stupid movies when we weren't flying, um, told a lot of jokes, made a lot of fun of each other. Um, what one of the guys notorious oh, that, keep going. Yeah. Sorry, no, you go. I was just saying. No, no, no. no I was just going to say air crew are notorious for all of that. So yeah, I, I was going to say one of the things you mentioned with the movies. Uh, one of the guys that I interviewed, Eric Neal, who was a Green Beret, and at one point, w wherever their compound was in one of the cities, they only had two movies. One was like season one of Downton Abbey, and one was Tropic Thunder. So they just watched yeah, them on repeat you. over and over oh. and over again. Yeah, we watch, uh, you know, we watch a different series and we watch, uh, uh, oh, Super Troopers was one of our favorites. Oh, yeah. So was that, great, that was great something one. that happened in, in the cockpit a lot, meow, um, happened a lot, meow, in the cockpit, meow. Just tried so, to like, uh, seed it in. Yeah. So, yeah, different that, you know, lines from movies would make it in. Um, I would even say sometimes uh, people would try to sneak in a, a one liner or a funny line or something on the radio to somebody, occasionally, yeah. something that the the person at the other end would have no context for or not get that everybody on the aircraft would be laughing their ass off. Um, that's how you keep it light. I mean, yeah. I, I will tell you multiple times I got home and, and the, on the flight back home, the consensus was, I don't want to see you F's uh, while I'm at home. I have no desire to go out with you or your wife or anything. I have no desire to be around you. I live with you for 90 straight days. I, ha I hope to God I don't see you. You know, it, it's, it's not just a roommate. It's like a roommate who is in your office right next to you all day long for five months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For three or four months, separated by a blanket, not a, a wall. <laughs> you're in a tent, and you've, you've each you partition a tent off into rooms with. I'll, I'll, I'll leave out the bad word that goes in front yeah. of the blanket, but yeah, yeah. yeah. Your your little hovel used to come. You go sit in your little hovel, but yeah. That's the fun stuff you do is fun, though. I mean, that's what makes it a crew. I mean, if you've read, you know, all the characters in Edge 22, you know, if you read that book, which is, it, it's a lot like that. It's as dark as that book is. Talking about World War II, I definitely see the, like, the, whatever, you know, the long blue line, or whatever you want to call it, that line of history that, that goes from war to war to war and inside those different organizations, companies, squadrons, you can see how that experience, it changes, but it doesn't, right? Yeah. That bond, the, the bond and the brothership doesn't change. The war and the experience changes, but then how how all of us, yeah, how you as a group react to it and get through it together. My, uh, my dad, who, who flew Hueys in Vietnam, when I would get together with him and some of his fellow pilots from that war, one of them would say, Hey, it's the same same shit, different toilet. Basically, like yeah. the only thing yeah. that changes is the location, but the uh, the bonds, the uh, the jokes, the missions, like they're all very similar over time. Yeah, well, yeah, it, it, exactly. Um, so let's move on. Spring of 06 is my last deployment to Bagram, uh, and this was a very I'll say this is a very uh, high. This deployment I had a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Um, it. We'll talk about it in a few minutes. It was the the most impactful, probably my most most impactful or second most impactful combat mission I flew in the war happened that deployment. Um, and I also had to make some tough personal choices, professional personal choices that I want to talk about a little bit, but um, some context. So that 
at that point in the war, they had decided they were going to retire. Well, at that point in the Air Force and SOC, the, uh, the CD-22 was starting to come the tilt road. Um, and so, as as you know, anytime they bring a new platform in, they have they typically have to. You can't add platforms to the to the Air Force. Typically, you have to cut to a game. So the decision was to get rid of and retire the MC-130. That, that had been in the works for quite a while, and the, so our squadron was slated to transition to the CB-22. And that's the Osprey. The oh, Osprey. Right. So, so for people listening, so that the. The context that I'm getting to is that caused a lot of uncertainty for the squadron members because only the pilots and the loadmasters, and really not even the loadmasters, only really the pilots could transition to the road. So the rest of the squadron had to transition someplace else into AFSOC or, or not AFSOC. Um, so imagine like your normal PCS cycle and how much anxiety you have just trying to go from one unit to another in the military. And now you're doing that in this context of shutting a unit down. So everything's almost, it's almost a special process. It became a special process. And our commander had had the ball on that special process with AFPC, with the personnel center and with AFSOC headquarters. And there was a lot of uncertainty at our levels and a lot of rumors and a lot of just crap going around. Um, so which caused not the best environment to be flying missions. So, you know, I mean, you know this and for, for our listeners out here, you don't want distractions when you're flying combat missions. You really don't even want distractions when you're flying training missions. So Absolutely if you're not. distracted nope. distracted in any way, there's something on your mind that can cause people to make mistakes. Uh, and and luckily, we didn't make any mistakes. But that whole deployment, there was that doubt about where people, where their assignments are going to be, what's their future. And on top of this, you know, AFSOC was adding another base in Canada, New Mexico, and no one wanted to move to New Mexico because that's just, it's out in the middle of nowhere. So there were all these outside things causing distractions on that deployment. And luckily, once I, like I said, the bulk of my crew was the same, same guys. So, so we kind of just in, integrated the couple of new guys into the crew, fell right back into the old team that we had been in, in the OIF, um, the 05, the year prior. Um, and we, we started chugging along, doing our mission set. And at one point we get this mission that basically was, um, I can't, I think the place was called, um, Wolf, Fob Wolf. And it was down west of Kandahar. And I want to say, I think it's Taran Kaut, but I can't remember. It's, there's a valley that comes out of the mountains west of Kandahar. Um, and that, and that valley was like, uh, I want to say it was Taran Kaut was up in that valley, but it doesn't really matter. There's basically that valley led down into where, you know, that RC, what is it, RC West, where all the her- heroin was going, all the poppies. Okay. Yep. Um, well, that valley was a Taliban stronghold, and Fob Wolf was smack, <laughs> basically just south of the mouth of that valley. I mean, it was in Helmand, right? So, yeah, 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 that's like yeah. a stronghold for Taliban. Yeah, so yeah, so but that fob sat at the mouth of that valley. So think the mountains right here, and there's like this valley sticking out of the mountains. And fob was sitting right there. As out of that valley was a river, and that fob was sitting just on the west side of the river. And that fob was getting just shot up every day, mortared, shot at. Um, it got so bad, I think they couldn't even they they couldn't even leave the base. Um, they were they couldn't even mount combat patrols because the harassing fire was just so heavy all the time, twenty four seven, every day of the week. And they didn't have any barriers around their farm. They just had some containers, like some twenty and forty foot containers to live in, and they dug whatever they dug. What you army guys do? Did combat holes, trenches, and build bunkers. And that's and they sat on the top of this hill, and they were just getting barraged. And so. They kept putting in requests to get HESCO barriers, you know, the those like canvas yeah. containers that you put dirt in and you can make walls out of. So they tried to get it to them by helicopter. Or sorry, by road convoy first. Turned around, came back. Couldn't couldn't even get it. Too hot. Tried to do it by army helicopter. Too hot. Tried to get it by air, you know, normal C1 airdrop. Um Mission denied, too hot, too dangerous. Everybody said too dangerous. 
Um, so finally, on that fob was a a, um, a combat controller, the STS guy. There was a small STS that attached there, and they assigned to whatever the conventional unit were there to do JTAC stuff. Um, and he, that staff sergeant or tech sergeant, whatever he was, finally got fed up, and he put an air support request in through our channels, through the soft channels. And it came to us, and we looked at it, and said, yeah, we can do that. So um, so we're like, okay, we can do that. Snare drop, it's right in our mission, we'll do that. So we spent the day planning and came, come to find out that these Hesco bears really dropped in, a, in what we call container delivery style or container delivery system, um, but that they were gonna use non-standard shoots. So shoots we didn't have ballistics for, so that was an issue. So the load masters had to do a bunch of research for the ballistics. This was far enough into the war now that it wasn't just, you know, my first deployment, Afghanistan was the drop zone. Didn't matter where you dropped, just had to hit the ground. And some friends had to be nearby to grab their stuff. Now you had to have a drop zone. So I spent the day basically building and certifying a drop zone and showing my young nav how that was done. And so we basically put this mission together where we did something, you know, we did things that were way out of the ordinary. We, we normally... Normally, if you build and certify your own drop zoners and do your own safety certification, like I did everything for it, um, normally you like go visit the ground that you're going to drop on and do all that stuff. So like we're doing that on standard, we're dropping on standard shoots, because, doing because all this you're stuff. not going to visit. You're not going to because we're not going to visit because it's what's the ballistic. What when you say ballistic? Um, so parachute every parachute has ballistics. You're dropping them; they have ballistics. What I mean by ballistics is they have a, a drop profile, like how fast they drop, how far they drop, oh, how long the shoot takes to right. open, all that. Stuff. Makes so sense. it's a computation. Yeah. yeah. So that's why I said, that's why I ended up as a nav and it fit real well with me. It's a lot of math. It's a lot of like computational analysis. Um, I mean, all that stuff's done by the computer, but you have to understand it all. So, um, so then the load masters went and got figured out a comparable ballistic set that we could use that we could put in the computer so that we could, we could drop precisely. Um, and then we took off, we flew down there for basically the time we got at altitude run in, we were getting shot at the whole way down the down the track. We didn't get hit, but we were getting shot at. See the flashes all over. The base was under attack. Dropped the load. Two of the two of the twelve bundles burned in. The shoots disintegrated um, because the load was probably not too heavy or whatever for the shoots. Ten of them hit the ground, smack on the middle of the LZ, and we flew home. Great, perfect mission. You know, did something great. It was very impactful. About f- three days later. They finally, it, the fire slacked. They, they left the equipment on the DZ for three days. They couldn't even get to the drop zone for three days. Because um, they were fighting. They were fighting where they were getting shot. That, you know, the, yeah. the harassment was so heavy, they weren't going out outside of their bunkers or whatever. Um, you know, three days, it slacks up enough. They were able to, you know, get a truck and a trailer or get, you know, do some half or whatever, get some of their vehicles down there and they pick up the escalators. Um, they sent us pictures. Um, the biggest smiles I've ever seen. Guys hugging each other. Um, like the relief on their faces. And and it was like a three-word email, thank you so much, or something like that, from the SDS guy, because he could send an email through through his yeah. little stuff. But that's why I said it was like beyond the medevac I did in the first thing. That was like the most impactful mission for me. Um, you know, the crew ended up getting some awards for that, but I didn't need the award. That picture was the picture in the email was enough to know that 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 changed those guys' life on the ground was enough for me. You know, like we brought brought them something, we allowed them. Oh, also included in that picture. Sorry, there was one other picture I forgot. So those STS guys lived in our red like twenty foot container. So they brought those Hesco barriers back. You know, they built that wall three days later. They built that wall the next couple of days. So they didn't send it three days later. They sent it like a week later. Included in that was a picture of the hole in the Hesco, like the Hesco barrier with a big part of it blown out where an RPG had hit. And they had a before picture. No way. The barrier wasn't there and the red container was right there. And then the Hesco barrier was there. So we wouldn't have dropped that. You know, we could have had some soft fries dead from an RPG hitting a, hitting a, their living quarters, their working quarters. So that's why that was impactful. You know, you, you go through all of that training, all of that fighting, well, I, I say fighting, all that flying, all that work, and to know that, you know, you weren't just hauling some 
trash in or, you know, shot up vehicles out or whatever. I, I, I got to see things on the way that, you know, you're doing something, but that was like the most kind of visceral feedback of like what I'm doing is important. Am I wrong to think that it was pretty rare for you to actually get that feedback? I would assume. Oh you're, yeah. I mean, you're in dropping something, you're on to the next mission. You never hear what happens. You never hear, you know, occasionally, you know, a couple of years later, like I was lucky enough, I run across Chris Miller and, and Iraq and or Kuwait for LIF. And we start talking and we realize that I realize that he's that team leader. He realized, and then I tell him that, you know, like, and then you get the thanks that you deserve, you know, I don't know if it's you deserve it. You get thanks for that because those guys yeah. appreciate it. Um, but yes, to get that answer back. But the, the crux of that was that those guys were complaining for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on that until it took, until it got to us. I'm sure a Chinook pilot with any any set of, you know, uh, well, with a little bit of uh, cojones could have could have done that drop um, or could have found a way to get that. It, it, the, the point is, is like, that's soft. We always we always found our way to yes. It was never finding your way to no. I mean, that's that was the piece of that mission. It's like some all these other ways were asked to do it. All these other organizations in the hell just said no. Just at that point in the war, you're like, come on. And how lucky that they had like an Air Force SOC person on the ground to know that that was even an option. Like I I would never have done that, even as a pilot. I wouldn't have known like, hey, I could ask an MC-130 unit to come and do this. Right. I can ask my other chain of command. And that's basically what he did. He was he was a take on to whatever tactically take on to a a, a unit where he was going, he and his partner were the only soft guys there. And he had a channel to ask for some assistance. So he used it. And um, yeah, that. Yeah, those so those little things yeah. you don't ever think of that impact people's lives are, are big. And then. Um, that mission was, you know, that was a big boost for us to to feel like, hey, we really did something important for these guys. And um, and of course, um, at the same time during that deployment, um, we hauled the same pallet with the same set of Humvee tires around the whole theater probably twice. So like that, literally this pallet because our loadmasters started marking the tires with chalk because this pallet kept showing up on our aircraft and we would move it to. All the else, or we'd move it to, you know, like, what was your base called out in, you know, Salerno? Despite, yeah, we'd move it to Salerno and then we'd, we'd go back to Salerno and we'd pick it up and we'd take it to Kandahar and then we'd take it out east what, and what, take it out that, west. Mike? What it was just a pallet of Humvee tires. It was a pallet of like three or four Humvee tires. And I, and I still, we still, the wrong places. it just, yeah, it kept, it kept getting just being pushed in the air cycle till it till it was going around in circles. Yeah. So it's like like we were we were always wondering questions like that. It's like how how the dichot that's why I say catch twenty two, you know, Joseph yeah. book. It's like this combat unit on the ground who's being shot at 24-7 can't get supplies dropped to him yet. We could find a way to haul the same pallet of tires around theater three times over or five times over. It, it just makes no sense. I see I see it's that like, in your mash TV series of like periodically the same <laughs> palette turns up in the middle of nowhere. It's oh, like, it's great. Like, yeah. So that, that type of stuff just drove me nuts all the time. So the, the last bit of that. So by the end of that deployment, um, the crew was not in the best place. I think we were three or four days out from leaving a new crew engine. You know, our, when we rotated crews, that point we had two crews in theater and our partner crew had rotated and a new crew had showed up and then we were there and we were like we don't know when we're going home because the it was one of those weird things where that crew that rotated in was going to be our last crew from our squadron in theater so when we left we were going to be backfilled by another squadron different squadron and we had no clue when that plane was going to get there and and once they started on their trip across the ocean they started breaking everything so it took them longer to get there. So we were in this limbo of like, hey, we're in, you know, um, I don't know if you've ever heard Chris Stapleton's song, Midnight Train in Memphis. It's a blues song, but, you know, it's like 40 days in jail and 30 nights, the longest night. Well, the last couple of weeks of a, de- of a 90, you know, 70, 80, 90 day deployment, or well, it's supposed to be a 60 day deployment. Now you're at 70 or 80. Yeah, every day is just brutal. Like, not only is when am I going to get all so low. So low. Yeah. Yeah. 
And then on top of that, we have all this uncertainty about assignments. There's all these rumors going around and guys are hearing that they're going to this place and they're hearing that they're going to go to this unit. And they're like, I don't, you know, and then there's just the general animosity of guys like itching in the tent every day. I don't want to go to this squadron or I don't want to go to this base. If I go to this base, I'm out. You know, all that's and in the in this cauldron of this going on with my crew, my aircraft commander does a stupid thing. He leaves his firearm. Let's just say he leaves his firearm somewhere he shouldn't have left it. And of course, we're on an arm, we're in a, we're inside a compound, a very a special compound with special people, where where guys can get away with a lot of you can get away with a lot of shit. You know, there was no People weren't running around and inside the compound. You didn't, nobody saluted, you know, all, all the traditional military BS just didn't happen inside that compound. That's one thing you can't get away with. It's losing, misplacing your weapon in a public place. Um, so he misplaces his weapon and he forgets his weapon and he t- just put it this way. He took his weapon off in a public place and then forgot to put it back on and went home and then realized he had went back to our tent. Realized what had happened, went to go get it, and it was our, it had had, of course, in all timing, luck, and circumstance, it was not in his side. The next person to walk into that certain public place just happened to be the sergeant. Oh, yeah, worst person to follow. Worst person to follow. Yeah. So suffice it to say, um, he was in, he was digging himself out of a hole at that point, and then. On top of that, we get a no notice alert for a mission. For like, and this is, I mean, and this is not happening at, you know, three o'clock in the morning and it's a no notice alert for mission tomorrow night. It's a mission for like, you need to take off and like, you need to go brief and take off in like an hour and a half, two hours. Oh, and we have the, we, we've built the plan for you. So, so they knew it was coming. They had time to build the plan, and then they decided at the last section that they were going to, you know. And here we are expecting to go home. We're expecting to be on a C-17 home within a day or two. Yeah. So they come in the tent, and uh, I can see it. Now, I'm a major at this point. And my aircraft commander is a major. And my aircraft, and my aircraft, And so they come in and say, we're, we're going to have you guys fly the mission, and we're going to have the, aircraft, the new aircraft mm-hmm. commander, which just came in with the other crew, fly with you. So they weren't even going to pull the, like, because they didn't have a uh, extra duty pilot deploying. Um, uh, so, the, the, you know, typically something like that happens and we go, the NAVs would go start planning. So myself and the NAV, I think we start to go off to go planning and uh, our aircraft commander's like, I'm not, I'm not flying. In fact, I've got to go deal with this. He's in trouble. So he's off dealing with that. And they're telling me this. And the guy that comes in that tells me this is a senior navigator with a friend, and then we go off and I start planning, and I'm sitting there thinking, and I'm, I'm looking at the response of my crew, and they can't do this time. You know, this is not right. These guys are going to something back. People's heads are in the game. Um, and the reason they didn't watch the crew that had just got the theater was one of the navigators had cold, had a head cold, so he couldn't fly. He was DNF. Duty's not clue to fly. So he showed up to nap. And then probably from the airplane flight over or something, who knows, you know, got it from his kid, whatever. Um, so I'm sitting there thinking, and I decide, you know, I'm going to go talk to Lumpy, is the gentleman's name. This was his name. And I go talk to Lumpy. And, like, and Lumpy was my instructor. He instructed me through C- MC-130 school. And, wow. and I remember distinctly when he instructed me through MC-130 school, he's like, you know, you can always come to me. You can always tell me something's unsafe. And I'll always go support him. Something to that effect. And I basically went to him that night and said, you can't have us. You know, you, you always said it. If somebody was going to be unsafe, if something was going to happen, I could always come to you and, you, would, you know, you would advocate for us or you would help us figure this situation out. It's, it's not going to be safe. We're not going to be safe. The, the guy's heads aren't in it. They're stuck at, you know, they're, they're ready to go home. They've been ready to go home for a week, you know. Our relief has been, you know, breaking in every beautiful city in Europe on their way over. Um, and uh, it's a bit of an exa- a slight exaggeration, but some yeah, of it's true. Yeah. Um, you know, we can't do it. He's like, well, someone's got to do it. What's your solution? I said, my solution is I'll go fly. I'm in the red line. 
I'll go fly with the other crew. I'll go, I'll go fly us the down. I can do that. I, I'm familiar with the mission. I've got my head on screw on straight. I'm an instructor. I can do that. Um, but we can't do that. And um, I had some other gaffes at this point. And I was the type of guy that would dig myself a hole and then climb out of it just to probably dig myself a little hole. <laughs> that's, that's a good way to describe my career at times, especially in that squadron. Um, uh, so I had just dug myself out of a hole. And then this whole thing happened on top of another issue that had happened, well, that deployment. It was totally unrelated to flying. And um, so I flew that mission and I got back in the, the our number two, our d- director of operations was that guy. Uh, was was not my commander, but he was he was a good he was an advocate of mine, and he was running the mission set. But when he was in theater running mission, he was he was all about the mission. It was like his mindset was always you just you just you just hack the mission, do the mission. I don't care what you know. He just wanted to do the mission. He's like, I don't know how. He's like, Mike, I love you or something. I like you know you know I respect you, but man, how could you dig yourself another hole? You just got out of a hole. How could you do this? He's reaming me on this, and I was just like, oh. Oh, I'm going home. I'm not going to get my assignment. Like all this, but uh, years later, still one of the proudest moments you know, I think in my career. And that there were two or three times where I did what was right, not what was convenient or best for my career or the circumstance. And, and it was one of those times. That years later, I got to command an ROTC squadron, and I or you know, and I got asked that question several times. Like, sir, what you know, what were the hardest decisions you made as an officer? And like, obviously, the ones. The ones where I was doing the right thing and and people were pressuring me to not do the right thing. And where I stuck to my guns and I did the right thing, what was right for the unit or what was right for my teammates or what was right, you know, by the regulations or rules. You know, you, when you leave, what I don't think a lot of people understand about the military is that aren't in the military is when you leave the military, you're just another person, just another civilian. You know? Your wings, your medals, they don't get you anything. A cup of coffee still still costs a cup of coffee, you know? Yeah. Starbucks doesn't give me a free cup of coffee every time I walk in the door. It costs me four ninety five, just like you, just like everybody else. So I'm sure you agree with this. You got to be true to your integrity, right? You got to have something to stand on. And when I look back on 20 plus years of that career, those are the things that beyond those couple of missions, those times when I was, I guess, stuck to my guns and and held my and kept my personal integrity and thought it was in line with even my teammates or mission or whatever is is the moments I'm most proud of. Not not the fact that I made a certain rank or held a certain role or had a certain job. It's, it's those times that always make me feel the best about my service. Is that in that scenario, Mike, if you had not said anything, the the other outcome, the likely outcome would have been a crew that was, you know, did not have the mission focus required for something like that was about to go on that flight, basically. Yeah, it would, it would have been, you know, putting, you know, your air, the air crew concept of the error chain, the, the, you know, the CRM, crew resource management concept of the error chain. That's, that's, that was one of my steps. I, I wasn't like saying that to my compatriot that, hey, that you can't have us flies because this is an error. It, it was, I, we were an accident waiting to happen. That's yeah. how I did people's heads were not in the game and somebody could have, it could have been, it could have been some minor mistakes that didn't yep. do anything. It was a pretty vanilla mission that I went on that night with the other crew. I mean, it was, it wasn't a hard mission. Um, they were excited. They wanted to go fly that mission. Um, so their heads were in the game. They were chomping at the bit because they're just in theater. Everybody's that we first get back in the theater. So was there anybody yes, in your, your regular crew who was frustrated? They didn't get to fly that or were they? Fairly I know. I think, they, I think they were all relieved. They were very happy. With, yeah. You know, because I went back to the tent. Uh, the, the the tent really wasn't a tent. It's like a canvas structure of wood. And I went back to that thing and I said, "Hey, this is." I went and talked to Lumpy. Um, the other crew's flying. I'm flying with them because they need an hour. You guys don't have to fly tonight. And I got a couple of thanks and, and relief and just some, you know, this some positive shakes of the heads. You know, a couple of these were like, "Yeah, that's the right thing to do." Um, yeah. And and we want, you know, I think we were flying mission where our aircraft commander was there. That was the other thing. They they thought our aircraft commander was getting raw deal with, you know. Um Yeah. Yeah. So he left his firearm someplace. I mean it was like 
if you're inside a inside a compound, inside a compound, inside a compound text. Yeah. It's like not some game worker wasn't going to stumble upon his his handgun and, and you know, cause an incident. Um, right. I get why they went off on him. He, he's he, not a private running around. He, you know, he's an experienced, <laughs> yeah. you know, 13, 14 year military guy shouldn't leave his weapon right but shit happens. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's I think to, he would have been there. It's hard to underscore just how complacent, frustrated things oh, get yeah. at the tail end of a deployment. Uh, um, I, I don't know of anything like it in the civilian world to equate it to, but like the the emotions, the tensions, family dynamics that are about to come back into play, like it's a really tough environment to be in when you're coming back. Yeah, from deployment. I would say I would say the best analogy is um, the losing team in the final minutes of like um, a playoff run, a deep playoff run, the first one. That's about the only thing that I can think of as a pretty, you know, yeah. like like you've poured your heart and soul into something. You pull, you've sacrificed all that time, effort, energy, and now things aren't going your way. Um, and it's that you, you you see it when those athletes get frustrated. It's the same kind of frustration at yes. the end of the tournament. Like you just want it to be over. With. You just want it to end. And it's and it's worse than that because it's worse than the game because it's just a game. And right. The thing with no, the deployment sure. is the thing with the deployment is is this, there's no like happy outcome of it. It's like it's. You just want it to end so you can go home, right? So you see your family, so you can reset, knowing that you just have to turn around and do it again. And a game ends at a fixed time, generally, yeah. whereas a deployment yeah. could be extended a couple of days. Who knows yeah. what happens, months? Yeah, I think, like I said, I think that deployment ended up going like 88 days. It was only supposed to be 60. And you always thought 60 really meant like 66 because it's yeah. three days to get there and three days to get home. But um, yeah, on that you know, so that whole five years to give people an idea what you like, you know, army guys during that five year run were going for a year on and a year off. Um, I don't know what the Navy was doing at that point. You know, in, in our world at ASOC, you know, I had squadron guys that were going 60 days on, 60 days off. And I was going four, you know, two or three months on, four months off is about the second. Well, I was going two and a half years and five years, basically. So, and you mentioned the family impact, right? Like, yeah. What, what did you get as your follow-on? It, you know, I think that's one of those things that we haven't touched on. Yeah. So I actually uh, asked to go back to the schoolhouse and was was allowed to go to the schoolhouse. So I went to Randolph Air Force Base in Texas as a navigator instructor. Got it. Okay. Um, and so my son was born in '04, um, and so the last two years. Uh, in my time in that squadron, my son, I was gone for my son for a year at that time. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, yep. And then, so that was, there were a big consideration of why I wanted to go to the training, the, the training command in the schoolhouse was um, my wife was pregnant with our second at, at the end of, at, during that whole last deployment and um, was to get that, that family time. That yeah. was the big piece. Was, and that wasn't necessarily the best career move to make also. I mean, if I maybe you really wanted to make a good career move, I would have moved to one of the other squadrons in AFSOG. Um, probably the squadron, one of the squadrons that's a little lesser capable aircraft because as my squadron commander said, I would have been a bigger fish and smaller pond. Um, and a lot of the guys that did that all went on to become O sixes and squadron commanders, and fly the J model and do all that fun stuff. But I wanted, I chose the family side. I'm glad I did it because I don't know if my marriage, you know, you don't know how your marriage would care seeing how other people's marriage shared. Yep. Um, and then um, I was lucky from that point for the next uh, 10 years, I I did in the Air Force, we have what's called a control tour. I did three control tours back to back. So I did that tour at NAV school, which was a control tour. Now we were deploying people uh, as individual auditees out of that squadron. That- but the day I walked in, the day, not the day I walked in, when I had my first interview at the, the director of operations of that squadron and he had obviously looked through my jacket and um they one they were really happy to have like a soft nav they they didn't have a lot of soft guys at nav school so they were very happy to have somebody with my experience there to pass on some of that training sure. experience to the other guys and then or to the new abs and then he looked at my combat deployment my combat record my deployment record he's like he looked at me straight as a mike you're never going to deploy out of the squadron he's like i've got guys that have never deployed in their four years in the air force here 
guys that flew three years of in a normal unit and now they're brand new instructors and in training. And he's like, build a play. Good. For you. He's like, yeah. I'll figure it out. Um, then I went to a staff job at Soxel. Um, same type of thing there. It's a, you know, theater, theater soft command. Um, you can't deploy out of theater soft command because, uh, you have to be able to deploy to your theater if something happens. So if something would have happened in Colombia or Venezuela or Honduras or any of those kind of hotspots in South, we would, we would deploy and run the, run the headquarters for that. So, um, and then ROTC was my last assignment in the Air Force in New York City as a commander of an ROTC detachment. And that was a really fun job. And everybody could deploy out of that except for the squadron, except for the commanders. That's so, so I lucked out. I had ten straight years. Yeah, I had six six years in the most deployed unit in the Air Force, and then I didn't deploy again. Now, at that point, after the ROTC unit, the, the writing was on the wall. It was either retire or or get a one year, you know, a one year assignment to yeah. to Kuwait or yeah. or uh, or Afghanistan or someplace. So, well, Mike, let me ask you this. I guess as we as we start to wrap up here, the the post military time you said you know like hey your wings don't really buy you a cup of coffee how how do you carry your military experience um per, persona maybe uh with you in the civilian world what's that been like for you been really uh to be truthful really tough really hard actually i think the hardest transition for me was the hardest thing i've ever done I, I, bar um like like we talked about last that, that first part one, you know, very driven, very self, very focused kid, knew what I wanted to do, went and did it. Right. Um, you know, and then lucky enough to get up here and to get it. I was a ROTC commander in New York City. Whoever thinks about that. You know, so I had all the opportunity to make connections and meet people. Well, um, and I had this desire to I didn't want to pound my head against the government brick wall anymore. I didn't want to be a contractor. Yeah. I didn't want to do any of that stuff. I had no desire to do that stuff. Um, so, and I thought, I was naive and thought that would be, that, you know, hey, at this point, it's like 2016, 2017, everybody's yelling about how great the military, you know, like there's a lot more support now for us than there was for your dad, right? For sure. And he, that kind of led me to be, I guess, a little overconfident. So I thought I'd get a job with like a big bank really easy or something like finance or something like that in New York City. It took me a year and a half to find my first role in the military. It was really hard. That's tough. But, That's tough. And and I will say some of the factors for that is it's a lot, a lot harder for someone leaving the military. It's actually a lot harder for retirees to transition to the, yep. the straight civilian sector than it is for, for people mid-career or low. You're um, so because, senior at the time that yeah. it's it's hard for companies, I think, to understand like, hey, we could bring this person in, but it's odd because of how old they are, how much experience they have, when obviously yeah, well, you could do any of those jobs. You can yeah. obviously do any of those jobs, but the common common message was like, you know, you know, a uh, a, a fifteen year or a twenty year guy who works in a bank can't just can't show up and be a, a, a commander of a fighter squad. Might argue with you know you're probably right in some regards, but most of them, but some of them could. Yeah. Because being a commander of a fighter squadron doesn't doesn't mean you necessarily have to fly a fighter, right? I'm sure you could say the same thing. But you don't necessarily you're leading people. It's about leading people. It's not necessarily about yeah hacking the mission. But that being said, there is a point to that. You can't just come in and be a director or a vice president in a large company and it's really not about your abilities. It's more about your uh, the perception of you and your, um, well, your ability to be, um, the word just slipped out of my head, um, your competence to display that you're competent in your job if you don't have knowledge about what, you, what field you're working. Um, so that, like you said, that was really hard for, for people to wrap their heads around. So I did a sales job for a year and that wasn't a great fit. And then, um, then I went to work for a government contracting firm because yep. I needed a job and they paid well and they were loyal and they helped me out. And then they, I, I won't go to that story, but that didn't end as well as it should have, but, but well. Then I went to work for a startup, you know, that, and that was a great opportunity to work with a friend of mine. And um, 
the startup just didn't do that great. And so they cut costs, you know, and who did they cut? They cut the people that were experienced. You know? So I was working with a fellow vet in a, you know, he's an army guy and an Air Force guy, and we were running operations for the startup. So it was a good match. And, and, and we were working for a very thoughtful and gentleman who was the COO that I really liked. And he was the first to get let go. And then the rest of us slowly, you know, after that. So it is what it is. And then, I went to work for another company. It was a dream job. It was in a in a field where I had a lot of personal interest in, uh, a lot of passion for, and I thought it was a great job. But, it, you know, I think my military persona hurt me there um, because I, as my wife likes to say, I'm, I'm a very, it's the best way as I come across, uh, I come across very military or blunt or whatever you want to call it. Is that formal, intense? What does that mean? Um. Especially with this, I've always had like a uh, perception versus reality issue in how I communicate. So how people perceive me isn't necessarily how I perceive my message. Um, I've worked on it a lot, you know. So, but the military was a good fit for my persona. Um, I would actually say the military calmed me down, which is rare, you know. Just it yeah. tempered it tempered my personality. Um, so. Yeah, so that that job was I was leading a team and the team just didn't connect with me. So, you know, and it's probably better off for both of us in the long run. And now I work for a company called uh well, I work for a company you're familiar with, uh that's a uh Greencastle uh consulting company that's a hundred percent veterans. Um which is probably something I should have looked for from the get-go, but there's very few out there. <laughs> yep. It's you know, it's it's hard. I mean, I would like to ask you what's your experience because you went you went into what uh, would you work at before Netflix, Twitter, or is it Google? Google. Google. Yeah. yeah. But I had I, I left the army before I went to the CIA, and I did sales consulting, and I just I felt no connection to it. You know, like I didn't yeah. feel the mission was there, or the camaraderie, and I needed to get back to it, like almost like a drug. And so I went to the CIA um, and it was a great fit. And then when I exited the second time, I was more deliberate about where I went, what I was trying to do. And I guess I, I just like tracking down bad people, you know, and like helping good people, but, you know, very yeah. plainly. So trying to figure out where that, that line was. And even when I left the army, Mike, it's funny you mentioned it. Like I wanted to do finance. I had an MBA. I wanted to do something in banking. It was 2009. It was right after the 08. Oh. crash it's just yeah. terrible timing um but i i don't think i would have made it there anyway even if i could have landed a job like i i just like going after bad actors so like i, I kind of found that thread and i've tried to stay with that cyber security trust and safety on that, that sort of thing yeah pulling on that thread yeah so i, I would say the, the biggest thing with me is that is I finally realized, and my wife helped me with this, is like, you are who you are. I am who I am. I need to be around other veterans. I need yes. to have people that understand my point of view, my experience. I need that. But it's not even that. It's just that, uh, what do you call it, that common experience. Yeah. Um, because it it's just, I've been there too long. It's, 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 sometimes it's hard to relate. So I need yeah. some connection. Um, and you didn't just happen there, you know, like, I think we don't just stumble into the military most often. It's because we're, we're drawn there for different reasons, for good reasons. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, like, I've got all this stuff behind me, obviously, for the podcast. But there was a point in time where I just put that in a closet. Like, and for people who are listening and don't see this often, but like, I've got pictures and coins and books and all that. And I think people need to lean more into that. Like, that's a part of you, who you are. Like, you... you yeah. Just talk about the, the bleeding, the sacrifice, like time away from family. You know, it's not easy to just pack that up and throw it in a closet. So the more yeah. I talk to people, the more I think like you can't try to hide that away. And to your point of like finding veterans, I, I wish I knew that the first time I came out of the out of the yeah. States. And so uh, I mean, so I mean, I'm very early in this this role with this company, but already I can see just the culture difference, just the the ability to to be told here's your here's here's what here's kind of the lane you need to work in and go teach yourself and if you need help that the one thing i've noticed is that that there's a lack of that kind of like stab you in the back type of mentality yep. that that you find in the corporate that that because 
corporate world, I, I hate to say it this way, is cutthroat. I mean, it's kind of the nature of corporate, corporate yeah. or capitalistic corporate culture. It's like if we're not, if we're not, you know, making our product better and figuring out a way to sell our product by hook or crook or whatever else, then that seeps down into the culture of people. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So veterans, in my big thing now is I'm gonna stick stay close to veterans. You know, if if you know if I ever leave this firm, I'll be very deliberate about where I go and it'll be to work. I'll at least need to work for a boss who's a fellow veteran. So yeah. You know. No, I hear you loud and clear on that. And <laughs> jeez. So well, Mike, I really appreciate it, man. Is there anything else to say before we wrap up here? I know yeah, it's so, the first round, but yeah, what else? I know. So um strongholdfreedomfoundation.org for your listeners. Um, if there's anybody interested in helping, donating or or helping out for to support any of the K2 vets out there, I know a lot of people don't know about this story. There's been some pretty big news stories, you know, via CBS and some other people. You can you can look up Hershey Comic on the internet. You can read about it. You can read about some, some of the gentlemen out there told their stories and, and ladies and told their stories of the illnesses that they've dealt with. Um, it's it, it could use a lot more voices. We could use a lot more voices in support. I'm not. I mean, I keep up with it. I'm not a board member or anything like that. I just know they're they're doing good things for for those of us that that need the VA to take care of us. Um, and that's like. And, and as I said before, you know, not all combat, not all veterans are combat veterans, but all veterans that go to a combat zone can can suffer different types of trauma. Um, and, you know, for all, all of us that serve at Karsh Kanavad, we all have that thought in the back of our head from time to time that when's that silver bullet coming for me? When's that cancer or that autoimmune disorder or uh, whatever? So, you know, and it's, this, you know, I'm blessed. Um, I can take care of myself. I'm financially sound. I've got a great family, but some of these guys and girls, you know, they're they're not that way, and they don't they don't have the ability necessarily to take care of themselves if something befalls them. And if the VA isn't going to, you know, if the government isn't going to acknowledge that they they sent us there, and they knew it. That's the thing. There's lots of proof. They now have lots of proof that shows that they knew that there were issues at that base. Um, before they even agreed to go there. So well, I appreciate it, Mike. Um, we'll get the, that link in our description so people can find it. Thank you so much for all the time, part one and part two. And again, you know, we didn't touch on a whole slew of things here that we hit on in part one. Like people want to hear more about the, the mission set, the MC-130 configuration, the experience of getting into that aircraft, all of that is there. Um, so thank you for the time, man. It was a blast. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you for the opportunity. I, I loved it. Um, I appreciate it. Like I said before, it's cathartic to, to do this, to speak with, especially speak with fellow veterans or not. Yeah. Um, someone that has heard your story or knows, knows much about you, you know, just seeing your reaction is, is awesome. Like, yeah. The fact that you know so much about the military and the CIA and other fun stuff, and but you still are surprised and shocked by some of the experiences that, that all of us go through. It's, it's cool. So keep doing what you're doing and and when you start selling those shirts let me know so i can buy them will do man I'll, but we do sell them we got a link for them so i'll get it i'll get one over to oh. you and we'll have to I'll, I'll i'll get on the link and buy one and you're not going to give one to me. Ah, all right thanks a lot mike appreciate all it right. have a good one i hope you enjoyed this combat story got a couple listener comments here one is from the ryan neal episode and it's from uh, Lori one two seven zero and she says, great episode. Thank you for sharing your story with candor and heart. I understand from the opposite side. When Ryan spoke about families, it's difficult for all members in the family. Thank you for sharing. Ryan, I found your podcast when I went down a rabbit hole uh, regarding PJs and 18 Delta Medics. I appreciate your podcast style and your guests and their stories so much. I keep coming back to learn more from these amazing men and women. I've been a military wife and I'm surprised to find many similarities and difficulties from my point of view between Navy carrier combat pilots and their jobs, in, in quotes, their jobs and special forces. Thanks. And it is so true. The more we hear from these, these elite pilots, um, like intake, official, killer chick. And I know some of those are Air Force, but you're, you're speaking specifically to the Navy carrier pilots. Still a very intense job. 
even the training environment is lethal. You lose so many people along the way and you're always right on the edge and you got to be so uh, aware you cannot be complacent. And I think that's so true across the board for these special operators. Thank you so much, Lori, for leaving that. It means a ton. And I uh, hope we keep these coming for you. And then the next uh, listener comment is from a subscriber on YouTube. It's CVN8268. And this is on the uh, Top Gun Maverick, the making of Top Gun Maverick from the aviation standpoint with uh, with Intake, Randy Howell, and Kevin K2 LaRosa. He says, if these guys aren't the reason for the next generation of aviators, then something is wrong. And I agree wholeheartedly with you here. Um, one of the things that we mentioned during that interview was uh, apologies to all the parents out there because I think we probably recruited a handful of young men and women who are now thinking, how do I get into the cockpit and go and do those things in my life? But yeah, I appreciate all the people who turned up for this one. Uh, definitely check out that Ryan Neal episode or the Top Gun Maverick making uh, video. That one was a great one with three legends in the aviation community, um, including the person who Tom Cruz asked to teach him to fly. So if that tells you anything, thank you so much for listening, y'all stay safe.